Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Project Endure Podcast. It's episode 24. You have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very special guest down in Florida, Kelsey Ward. Kelsey, how are you? I am so good. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Of course. I've been looking forward to this for a while, and I think once the conversation gets flowing, people will understand why, but why don't we just let you introduce yourself to the audience, and we'll kind of take it from there. Sure. So my name is Kelsey Ward, and I'm an online health and fitness coach. Um, And I like to say that I help badass women break through their own boundaries because um, I think that is kind of like the metaphor of fitness for us. And, you know, as coaches, we are here for training and nutrition, but so many times we (laughs) delve into so many parts of people's lives. And I feel really lucky to be a part of that transformation process for so many people. Um, I have a daughter who is a crazy little spitfire and takes up so much of my day and um, a husband and two dogs. And yeah, I'm just trying to figure out life along the way. Oh man, that's awesome. Well, so we share the online coaching in common and I'm curious for you, well, one, how long have you been doing it for? And two, maybe what is your biggest struggle as a coach? Cause I, I know I have many. So I've been doing it um, online for two years. I was a fifth grade teacher Mm. when um, the schools shut down during COVID and I knew that I was going to pursue online coaching anyways. So in that period of time when I was working from home and was able to really dig my feet into the ground and launch my business, I kind of took that time to my advantage. Um, So I've been doing it for two years And biggest struggle, I would say for me is not being able to do the work for my clients, because as a coach, you see the potential in somebody and you know that they're capable of such great things. Um, But at the end of the day, they have to be the ones to do the work. And that is where the growth and change comes from. So biggest struggle is to just not be able to save them (laughs) when you want to. Yeah, I could relate to that big time. And I grew up not really knowing what a quote unquote online coach was. And I think that's because they probably didn't exist. The internet was still in its infancy, but I did have many coaches playing sports growing up. And there's a John Popovich quote that stands out to me. It's targeted at basketball, but really I think it applies to all coaches. And uh, he said, as their coach, your job is to set the bar high, inspire them to reach the bar encourage them, and most of all, guide them in the best possible manner and in the most supportive environment. And I feel like as a coach, we're really, we're guiding people. We're friends. We are a support system. We're encouragement. We are information and knowledge. Um, We help provide accountability. And at the end of the day, one of my biggest struggles or the hardest thing for me about coaching is that is when you see so much potential in another person. And for one reason or another, they're just not ready to uncover that potential. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's tough. Um, But enough about coaching. Let's dive into the good stuff. So I'm going to ask you the first question of the podcast and we will just let you run with it. And so the question is this, what is the hardest thing or circumstance that you've ever had to handle? So when I was in college, um, I was in a really rough relationship and I didn't know at the time how rough it was. I was really mentally kind of manipulated, um, by that person and it left me with some disordered eating. And that's kind of what got me into coaching in the first place. Um, but backtrack to that time. I really had no control over my life or my body. And so my way of regaining that control was through food and deprivation. And at one point I had told someone, I don't even feel like I deserve food because my mind was just so warped. And so, you know, um, just, I was so out of sorts. Um, so I got down to like 89 pounds. It was a really bad situation. And then 
Eventually, I realized kind of what was going on. I sought treatment and dug myself out of that hole. And it's not something that I talk about too much anymore because I don't want it to be my story. You know, I don't want it to encompass like who I am. Um, and I don't want it to be my identity, but I do think it's important for people to see, like you can come from literally rock bottom, um, and rebuild yourself. Yeah. And, and to, to kind of ask follow-up question there, because I'm, I'm genuinely curious as someone who also had a period of life where food was one of the only things I, I felt like I could control. Um, and it wasn't something I was able to admit to myself for a really long time. Um, but I look back now and I could see how I got to that point. Right. And so when you look back at that quote unquote rock bottom in the weeks, months, years leading up to that rock bottom, were there points where you were aware you were headed in that direction and that you wanted to make a change, but just felt like you couldn't for one reason or another? Um, I do. I remember just it- feeling like every time I came home, because I was in college, I was away. Um, Every time I came home, like little things would be highlighted that I I was like, wow, I'm kind of different than when I left, you Mm -hmm. know, Um, and like little behaviors of mine, or I, I would feel because I was so deprived and and denying myself food. um, I would almost binge when I would go home, because it was like my safe place in my family. And there was, you know, comfort and, you know, safety around all of that. But then when I would go back to school and back to that relationship with the person, um, the whole cycle would start again. So I started to see things happening and changing. Um, And then obviously, with my weight, my my physical body changed so much. Um, And the sad thing about it is that it was not in regards to my appearance at all. It had nothing to do with my physical body. It was everything that was going around mentally and just grasping for that control. Hmm. That's so interesting because to somebody on the outside, I'm sure they would see you at 89 pounds and think, wow, there must be something physically going on related to appearance. Um, because I think a lot of times when people think of food and problems with food, we, we automatically assume it's appearance related. Um, but it was almost as if something deep down inside of you was not, was not right. Like something was off balance. You were trying to figure out how to regain control over your life. And so food became that thing and it had an external manifestation. And I'm curious for you at 89 pounds, like what was rock bottom? What did that look like? What did it feel like? And why was that rock bottom? And why were you able to build from that point? Um, I had a, uh, honestly, I don't know that I would have gotten myself out. I had some family members, um, when I would go home, I had some family members who mentioned things and, you know, that I needed to go seek help. And honestly, I was still so confused as to how I got there and why I got there. And even after seeing a therapist and getting treatment, I didn't feel like I had totally solved the problem. And I actually ended up staying in that relationship for a while. And it was only after I left that relationship, um, we actually got married and divorced, um, that I figured out, I kind of connected all the dots of like, that's what was going on. That's, you know, where the, the trouble came from. Yeah. Yeah. I'm almost going to skip ahead here to a question I ask at the end. I'll ask a variation of it. But when you look back at Kelsey then, and, and how old were you, Kelsey, when all this was happening? I was 19 is probably from the ages of 19 to maybe 21. So it lasted a while. Yeah. So, so if you were to be able to go back in time and just sit down and have a conversation with, let's say 20 year old Kelsey, what, what would you, what would you say to her? Gosh, I would tell her to look deep in herself and take a big step back, realize what she's capable of and realize that she deserves better, is meant for more and um, has to make herself a priority in order to make all those things happen. Mm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And and so it sounds like fitness became a way that you were able to help dig yourself out. And I love 
the way that fitness can be an analogy for almost anything else in life. And I'm not going to give you my point of view just yet, because I, I want to give you a blank slate here to paint a picture. But for fitness and life, what are the parallels that you see? And, and why is it so important that you have fitness as part of your life? So I would say the, the two main parallels became, for me, confidence and strength. Hmm. Literally, I, when I say that I think that fitness saved my life, I mean that to my core because it wasn't long after I started training and working out. I went from 89 pounds to, I don't know, I think I put on like 30 pounds wow. and it, a lot of it was muscle because I was in the gym. I was learning how to fuel. I was gaining strength and I was gaining confidence and within probably a year of starting to train, um, I left that relationship because I felt more confident in myself. I felt stronger. And I know it sounds silly to say like that physical strength gave me so much mental strength, but it really does. When you start taking care of yourself and honoring your body, you, you carry yourself differently. You believe in yourself differently. You realize that like those you know, even if it's just picking up a heavier dumbbell than you did the week before those little hurdles transfer into your life every single day. And so once I did that, I was like, I am strong and I am confident and I can take care of myself. And I walked out the door and I never looked back. <laughs> Man, I, I want to talk about fitness, but before I talk about fitness, I just want to ask you, because I would imagine there are people listening to this podcast who are in some kind of relationship, and maybe it's not a marriage, maybe it's not even a romantic relationship, maybe it's a friendship, for example, but they feel like they do need to separate themselves for whatever reason, but they're afraid. When you, quote unquote, walked out the door and you left, I mean, what did you experience? Was it automatically like this weight was lifted from your shoulders? Was it yeah. You nodded your head. Absolutely. The term or like the way that I described it was that I was a bird that was freed from a cage. Hmm. I had no intentions of leaving for good the day that I left, but, um, I kind of packed a bag. I was like, I'm just going to go for to my mom's for a day or two. But literally when I walked out that door, I was like, I had never had that feeling of being free and safe like that in so long. And I just kept saying, I feel like I'm a bird that's been let out of a cage and there's no way I could ever put myself back in that cage. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, you know, to, to take it back to fitness for a second, I loved what you said. I loved everything that you said. And for me, I agree with everything. And I also want to add that I think the reason for me, at least why fitness makes me feel confident isn't because of a way that I look or what I can necessarily do, but it's just this thing that you have to continue to show up for, right? Mm -hmm. You can't go to the gym for a year, attain a certain physique or level of strength or skill, and then just hang it up and say, well, I did it and I'll keep it. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to show up over and over and over again. And when you could show up for yourself in that way, like you can show up for yourself in any way. And, uh, and the other thing about fitness that I'm sure you know, and everybody listening who, who's involved with fitness knows, is that resistance reveals resilience. I love that saying. And it's just that when you go and you face resistance in the gym or in life, it's, that's the stimulus for strength, right? We have to struggle in order to get stronger. And that parallel is just such a beautiful one to me. So anyway, enough of me rambling about fitness. Let me ask you now about some of the hard things that you've done, right? Because in life, there are two kinds of hard, the hard that chooses us and the hard that we choose. And so with that being said, Kelsey, what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose? And why have you done that thing? Hmm. Are we talking just fitness or just life in general? Life in general. But if you want to give me multiple things, I'm all for it. Honestly, I think it, it was starting my coaching business. Hmm. I mean, that it's been, it, I, I know Instagram maybe makes it look like, you know, you just post a picture up one day and then you're just hanging out on the beach, you know, working wherever and like traveling the world or something like that. But for me, that wasn't the case. Um, 
it was it was a challenge you know it's a it's a steep learning curve if you and i know you're serious about your coaching business but if you're serious about it you know you have to have your systems in place you have to have your education in place you have to have your mindset in place like and for me um it's so all-encompassing i have trouble turning it off (laughs) so it probably shouldn't be as much of a struggle, I guess, as I've made it. But when you care about it so much and it's truly like another baby, um, you know, that's it. But and, and speaking of babies, I would say probably starting my family. Um, I don't like to say that it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's definitely the most consuming thing when you have a child. Um, especially in the early years, you know, that zero to two to three years old, it's so consuming. Mm. Um, but it's so rewarding at the same time. Yeah. So, all right. So let's take those one by one. We've got coaching, starting a coaching business and, and starting a family. Let's start with coaching. Now that's something I can directly relate to. And I want to reiterate what you said. It might look one way on social media, but starting and scaling and maintaining a coaching business is really hard. Mm-hmm. And I, I would be curious for you, what's, what's maybe one thing that was really hard? If you had to narrow it down to something specific, was it uh, learning how to market yourself? Was it growing your client base? Was it learning how to put systems in place? Like what was the hardest thing about the coaching? I'm a very like organized and analytical person. So the systems part came pretty easy, but I would say like establishing my brand and I'm not talking about like my colors and my logo and my font and and all of that, but really establishing my brand of like, who is my ideal client? Who am I trying to help? What are her pain points? What are her pleasure points? What is she looking for? Um, and, And how can I best serve her? So really trying to, determine that in the beginning, because, you know, in the beginning, I'm like, I'll help anybody, anybody who needs help, I'm here to help. Um, But realizing that, you know, if I could niche down and really put some time and effort into, um, you know, who my ideal client is, my values within my, my business, and just getting super clear on all of that. And it's very passion driven work. And you really have to be in the right headspace to kind of hammer out those details. It's not so analytical. And to me, that's kind of like the easier part. Um, But those were my biggest hurdles. Yeah, I can second that. And I think for me, two of the hardest things is one, investing into people sometimes doesn't feel productive, Um, right? You can think that coaching is going to go one way and you have your ideal system in place and your, your structure and the way that you want things to run. And people are people, right? They don't show up on time. They miss things. They aren't as consistent as you'd hope. They don't believe in themselves as much as you, you would want them to, right? All the list goes on and on. And a lot of coaching for me is like learning how to interact with people and meet people where they are and help take them to where they want to be. And oftentimes between meeting someone and then taking them to where they want to be, you have to walk with them through some messiness, through some uncertainty, through problems, barriers, struggles, obstacles, so on and so forth. And that's the hard part, but that's also the fun part. And then in terms of branding and building things, one of the things that I I learned early on was that people don't really care so much about me or you. Yes, we're very important. We need to be personable. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be there for people. But people really want to see themselves trans- transform. They want to know how we can help them solve their problems. And a lot of times I've, I've, I've noticed, and I don't know if you can relate, people's problems aren't like that they don't have a six pack. They might want a six pack, but why do they want a six pack? Yes. Right? Yes. Talk about it. Yes. No, I totally agree. Um, I was just talking to someone recently about this, that they were like, I have this vacation coming up and I want to look good in my bathing suit. And I kept, and, and we're, I think a little more accustomed to that digging deeper down into things. Um, and it was so hard for them to be like, to wrap their mind around it because all they could see was the swimsuit. They're like, what do you mean? Why do I want to look in the swimsuit? I, it's, I just want to look good. I'm like, no, no, there's something else there, you know, because it'll make you feel confident in yourself. And, you know, you, 
they don't realize the kind of associations that they have with that image of themselves. So yeah, I totally, I uh, have like parallel conversations with my females. Yeah. And it's right. Just to go back to your story uh, about your relationship with food, it wasn't again, because you didn't like how certain foods tasted or you wanted to look a certain way. It was a much deeper root. And I think as coaches, but really just as human beings, if we could understand that people um, act a certain way or want a certain thing um, because there's something deeper there, um, I think we could be a lot more empathetic, a lot more patient, a lot less judgmental. Um, and I think the world would be a better place. And so I love what you're doing and the way you approach things. And uh, we're, we're pretty similar in that. But yeah, for sure. Let's, let's transition now to the family piece of things. Um, I've had a couple parents on the show. And it's interesting to hear about how a child will change a parent's life. Um, I think the obvious ways are like, you probably sleep a little less, you probably <laughs> have less time for yourself. Um, but tell us about your experience um, bringing your daughter into the world. Yeah, so I have something called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which means I have cysts on my ovaries. And typically women with that do not get pregnant naturally. Um, I was very, very lucky and very blessed to get pregnant naturally. Um, and I had a great pregnancy, super happy with the way everything went. She was very healthy when she was born, but she did have colic, which means they classify colic as crying for more than three hours for more than three days for more than three weeks. So pretty much your child is crying and unhappy all the time. And there's nothing you can do about it. So that was a very harsh introduction to motherhood. Um, just feeling so helpless that, you know, you have this new child who is always crying and unhappy and you don't, you can't, you really can't fix it. It's just a phase. I mean, at least that's what my pediatrician told me, <laughs> um, but it, you just have to kind of let it run its course. So that was probably the hardest part. Um, you know, the, the lack of sleep, <laughs> the lack of time that all comes with it. But, um, I don't think that I would have ever launched my coaching business mm -hmm. if it weren't for her, because when I was teaching, I was leaving her and going to be with everyone else's children all day. And I would go to work every day and think, what am I doing here with everyone else's kids while mine is at home? I need to figure out a way to be at home with her. So if it wasn't for her, I would have never taken that leap. So I'm so grateful that everything worked out the way it did. Uh, that's so cool to hear. I was uh, talking to Adam Clink, who you and I both know on episode 10 of the podcast. And we were talking about his experience being a parent. And it kind of came to the surface that you almost have this superhuman strength when you have other people in your life who are equally important or maybe even more important than you are to yourself. Um, and I would imagine that being a parent it gives you maybe a little bit of a, a courage boost and a, a boost to just like, hey, I'm going to go make this happen because it's going to make my life better and my child li child's life better. And we're going to do this together. Was that kind of the case for you? Yeah, I think that there's almost like a subconscious responsibility, like yeah. extra layer of responsibility of, you know, um, needing to provide and, and care for your family for sure. Yeah. And I think when it comes to hard things, like hardship, adversity, challenges, struggle, um, the people who are able to endure things well are the ones who have a reason that's bigger than themselves. Because at the end of the day, if the only reason we're doing something is, is for ourselves, like at some point we're going to come up against some resistance or some problem or some challenge that's just bigger than that. It's bigger than us. And so we need to have this thing, this reason, this driving force that's bigger than us. And it sounds like your daughter, probably among many other things, is, is that reason. So since I mentioned it, let me ask you the third question. And that question is a simple one. What does the word endurance mean to you? So uh, I don't know. I think <laughs> endurance to, no, no, I, I know. It's just, I feel like it's constantly changing. Um, endurance, I, I would say it's mastering the monotony and making it mean something. And that's kind of like mm -hmm. one of my quotes, but that's, that's what I would tell myself whenever I was running. I know it's in, 
again, bringing it back to the training side, but that's kind of what I would tell myself when I was running is master the monotony and make it mean something. Or when I was working on a longer project that, you know, requires that endurance and just digging deeper than the surface level. Um, And when I hear the word endurance, I picture somebody who's very like calm, collected and stoic. You know, when you think about these races, it's not like a powerlifting meet. Everyone is enduring the race. It, they're not, you know, explosive and powerful and loud and yelling. Can you imagine like a marathon when everyone's just yelling the whole time? You know, I just picture someone who's calm, collected and stoic when I hear the word endure or endurance. Mm. I love that. One of my favorite books is Stillness is the Key by Ryan Holiday. And he studied the Stoics and uh, writes quite a bit about that stuff. But one of my favorite words is composed. And I really just love the image of, like you could have chaos all around you, but you are just totally composed and in control of what you can control and nothing else matters. Um, And you know what? It's interesting you brought up the marathon because there's this quote um, that I'll read in a second about marathons. And I think a lot of times we think of the marathon as an endurance event. And so I'm going to read this quote and then we'll talk about it. But it's by uh, Chris McDougall. And he said, humans are built for endurance, not speed. We're awful sprinters compared to every other animal. We try to run our races as if they were speed races, but they're not. They're endurance races. Even a marathon, the way it's run now, is not an endurance contest. And I think that's really interesting because most people on planet Earth think of the marathon and they think of endurance. But the way that we run marathons now, or at least the elite run marathons, it's it's speed, right? It's sub two hour. It's fast, as fast as you can. And I think that gives endurance a bit of a misrepresentation because oftentimes I think endurance in life is totally different. It's not running forward the whole time as fast as you can toward a finish line that you can see. It's stumbling, falling down, um, getting pushed back, sometimes standing still, but always moving forward in your mind and moving on to that next thing. And I love what you said about mastering monotony and making it mean something. Um, Both of those phrases are incredible. The alliteration is just off the charts. I love that. Um, But yeah, the monotony is something that is really important. And there's another quote that I think you'll resonate with because it's a training quote. It's by John Wellborn. And he once said, training is like moving a big pile of dirt. Some days you use a shovel, some days you use a spoon, but as long as you're moving some dirt every day, you're headed towards your goal. And uh, it sounds like that's how you show up in the world. And I'm curious for you, right? We see what you do on social media, but behind the scenes, like what are the days where you're using a spoon look like? Like on the days where you've got a spoon in your hand and you still have to move some dirt, like what does that look like? And how do you get through those days? In terms of like my, my own training, Let's go with your own training, but also just life in general, like on the mornings where you wake up and you just, your first thought is like, I don't have the energy for this. Like, how do you get up and and move forward on those days? Gosh, you know, it's funny when my alarm clock goes off on those days, I literally just give myself a pep talk for one minute. And it's, it's truly like one minute long. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself for like 15 minutes, but when I look at the time, only a minute, maybe two minutes has passed. Mm. And I literally just say like, you just need to get up and get through this moment. I don't think about the whole day ahead of me, all the tasks that need to get done. It's just tackling that one thing at a time. So that's kind of like my little spoon, just taking care of one thing at a time. And once that's done, crossed off the list. Then, like you said, maybe I need to stand still for a little bit. Then I can go on to the next thing. Um, But yeah, just taking it as it comes a little bit at a time, really. There were, I I know I didn't touch on this earlier, but... um, Last year, I ended up having to have explant surgery. I had breast implants for 10 years that were making me sick. Mm-hmm. And on those days, I literally felt like I was dying. Like, and I, I know it sounds kind of um, extreme to say that, but I was so weak and tired and sick. And I just kept showing up. And a lot of times 
my workouts were awful, but I, it was almost just like the naive part of me that was just like, well, just get up and try. I'm very optimistic. And sometimes it's to my own detriment. (laughs) Um, but yeah, just always getting up and trying and just one thing at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really easy for us to get ahead of ourselves or to live in the past. Um, and both of those things can, you know, they serve a purpose, but they can really hold us back when all we need to do is be in the present moment and just do the next right thing. And to bring it back to running, and we've talked about this on the podcast in previous episodes, but it's just the one foot in front of the other mentality. It doesn't matter what 10 miles down the road looks like. It doesn't matter what your last 10 steps looked like. It's just the next foot in front of the other over and over and over again, mastering the monotony and just making it mean something. And I think that's so cool. Now, have you always been an optimistic person? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> like too, like too optimistic and too, I don't want to say too trusting, but I always believe the best in people. Mm. You know, I always believe that everyone is doing their absolute best, even if it doesn't appear that way. Um, and I've always been very optimistic um, and just thinking that, you know, things will work out and the best will happen. And like I said, sometimes it's to my detriment because I almost get blinded to the realities of things that are going on. Um, but yeah. Huh. What well, would you change that if you could looking back at your past, the, the optimistic part of you that maybe sometimes borderlines on being a little bit naive? Um, I don't think so because I think without that, it wouldn't have led me to the experiences where I ultimately learned. Um, I would, I would, I would hate to, I would hate to look back and say, because of those things, it turned me into almost a cynical person. Mm. You know, I, I like the fact that I've held on to that optimism despite the experiences. And I'm grateful for those experiences, no matter how hard they were. Oh, uh, I, I love that. There's a, there's a great quote. I'll read you this quote. If you couldn't tell, I'm a quote guy. Um, <laughs> so Steve Goodyear said, Those who overcome great challenges will be changed and often in unexpected ways for our struggles enter our lives as unwelcomed guests, but they bring valuable gifts. And once the pain subsides, the gifts remain. These gifts are life's true treasures bought at a price, but cannot be acquired in any other way. And uh, I think it's just beautiful that like we, we all go through hard stuff, right? It looks so different for every single person. And it's painful. It's uncomfortable when it's happening. We probably just want it to stop. But when that stops, when we move on, when the pain subsides, we are changed and we have a gift of experience. Um, But I think the caveat there is we get to choose what we take away from the experience. And that's where I think your optimism uh, is such a cool thing and such a gift because you could have easily walked away from your past um, holding bitterness resentment, being cynical, letting that define your life, but you've done the exact opposite. Um, And I would imagine that's probably because you had people in your corner who are helping lift you up along the way. Um, Tell us a little bit maybe about your support system and who those people are and who those people were. So, um, gosh, back then when I went through that hard time, it was anybody and everybody. I leaned on my faith. You know, I started going to church. So the whole church community, um, my therapist, my family, and, um, now it's, it's mainly my husband, um, you know, coming from my past relationship, he, he was the one who took the brunt of that. You know, um, I carried a lot of baggage and he had to be super understanding and he's really my support system now. And, um, I actually just made a post on this the other day that he, he doesn't, he doesn't feed into any of my BS. So he doesn't let me lower my standards. He doesn't, you know, he, he sees, um, whenever I start to waver or maybe doubt myself or things like that. And, um, I'm grateful for his support in that way. Yeah. That's so important to have those people in our lives. And to your point earlier, cause I've been in those places where, um, you just, you feel really down. And um, I've been in that season and I know most people listening to this have at least experienced a taste of that. And in those moments, anything, 
Anything could mean the world. Someone holding a door for you, somebody Mm -hmm. asking how your day is, somebody smiling at you, a nice text message. Um, And so for the past, I'd say five, six years, I've used that season of my life um, to create habits and systems so that I can try and be that person for as many people as possible. Um, And so one practical takeaway for anybody listening to this podcast is just every day, if you can, think of someone who you haven't talked to in a while and send them a genuinely nice message. You know, hey, Kelsey, I know it's been a long time, but I was thinking about you today and just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate your positivity and everything you're doing. I hope you're doing well and have a great day, right? Something as simple as that can catch somebody at the right time and absolutely change the trajectory of a day, of a week, of a month, of a life. And, uh, and I just think it's, it's just, you know, you never know what people are going through, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Kelsey, I want to frame this last question to you in a very specific way. I've been doing this with all of the parents on the show. It's all of a sudden become a theme. I don't know where it came out of, but, uh, the last question is really aimed at people listening to this podcast who maybe are experiencing, um, some kind of hardship or challenge or struggle. Um, but as a parent, right? Your daughter someday is probably going to go through some hard stuff, just like we all do. You know, that's life. And so as you answer this question, I want you to also think of maybe you're just talking to your daughter someday. Um, So the question is pretty simple. And if somebody is listening to this podcast, going through a hard season of life, and you're talking directly to them right now, what advice or guidance or wisdom would you have for that person? I would tell them just to keep going. I'm going to fall back on my saying, which is breathe through it until you break through it. Um, Because if you can just, like we said earlier, collect yourself and um, breathe through it until you break through it. That's, I mean, that's all you can really do in, in those hard situations. But once you have your head on straight, then you can start really just problem solving and then start breaking through it. (laughs) Oh man, that's so good. How did that not come out until just now? That's like, you've got (laughs) these amazing mantras. I love this. Um, Okay. So Kelsey, listen, we're going to do something a little bit different. Okay. Episode 24. I am like seven cups of coffee into this day, which is dangerous (laughs) because it's 640 at night. Um, But I want to ask you a question that I haven't asked anybody before on the podcast. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And the question is, if you could tell the world three things that you know to be absolutely true, right? Irregardless of where somebody is, what circumstances they find themselves in, um, what time period they're in, if they're listening to this in 2022 or 2200, 2022, Mm -hmm. um, what are three things that you know to be absolutely true? And just to be fair, I think I stole this from Lewis Howe's The School of Greatness podcast, but we're going to roll with it. Okay. Three things that I know to be absolutely true. Hard work pays off. Mm-hmm. Gosh, you are putting me on the spot here. That's all right. I think that the absolute is throwing me off because I'm like, <laughs> what if it's not? Um, positivity is a choice. Ooh, yeah. And gosh, I don't know if it's necessarily a truth, but I would just say to always be kind. Mm-hmm. I know it's a little cliche, um, but I also find that the people who need kindness most ask for it in the most unkind of ways. So um, I would say that would be the third truth. Wow. Okay. Let me repeat those back real quick. So one, hard work pays off. Two, positivity is a choice. Three, always be kind. I, I mean, Kelsey, you've blown me away with some of the stuff you said tonight. And I want to dig into the hard work pays off before we wrap this up, because I think this is an important one. I agree 100% that hard work always, always pays off. And I'm curious if you would agree with this next part, but sometimes it doesn't pay off in terms of an outcome. And I think what I mean by that is hard work always pays off, 
because of the process and the person that it shapes us into through that process. I'm curious what you think about that. I agree 100%, 100%. Um, uh, another thing that I always say is civilize the mind, make savage the body. And I think that you get so much more um, from the hard work and the process in your mind than often you do in, in your body. But um, I would agree with you 100 percent. And I almost enjoy the process more than the goal. Me as well. Now, you just blow me away. So we're going to keep this rolling because I don't know what else is going to come out of your mouth. You just said civilize the mind, make savage the body that I like, that's a tattoo right there. <laughs> um, what, what other, you know, Kelseyisms do you have that you can kind of spit, spit at us? I think that might be the last one. Um, breathe through it till you break through it. Master the monotony, make it mean something. Civilize the mind, make savage the body. I think those are like my top three. I've been, you know, it sounds, it's silly, but like whenever I'm on the Stairmaster, the Stairmaster is like my nemesis. I always tell myself satisfaction over joy. And I know that some people can take that the wrong way. Um, but I, I, I get joy out of the satisfaction that I completed the hard task. It goes back to that hard work pays off. Again, it's only, you know, 20 minutes on a Stairmaster, but you can pull meaning out of that. Um, and so that's where I started saying sometimes satisfaction over joy. When, when I think of satisfaction versus joy, it's hopping off that Stairmaster would bring me a lot of joy. It would make me feel great. But finishing that mm. session on the Stairmaster, that's going to give me satisfaction. And mm. that's where I kind of came up with that one. <laughs> long-term, long it's always about the long-term, long-term satisfaction over short-term pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. So I'm going to give one more quote and then we're going to tell people where to find you and uh, connect with you. So the quote is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she said, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. And I think you're the perfect example, Kelsey. You've walked through some really tough stuff and you've come to this point of your life um, as a person with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. And it's so cool uh, to watch you do what you do. And I'm so honored to have you on the podcast. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's such a great conversation. And I'm so grateful that you are sharing yourself and all of your guests with the world, because I think so many people can take away a lot of lessons from what you're doing. Thank you. So, hey, Kelsey, if people want to connect with you or follow along with what you've got going on, where's the best place for that? Little Warrior Fitness on Instagram. I am like an 80 year old woman on Facebook. I don't know how to use it very well. So uh, find me on Instagram because uh, you're sure to get a reply back there. <laughs> Instagram it is. Well, Kelsey, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.